Thank you for staying with us. And if you're just joining us, this is Report Desk Africa, and we're just about to dig our phalanges, like they say in biology, into the meat of the show. Now, there's a growing race of Africa's attention and economic relations uh, by the world's superpowers, especially from the trio of China, Russia, and the United States. You can call them the terrific trio if you like. Now, the recent visit of the United States uh, Vice President Kamala Harris to Africa, with her first stop being Ghana, and the planned visits by Russia's Vladimir Putin, uh, have raised eyebrows amongst African, Africans, leaving them to question if these recent visits mean well for the continent. And New Central's Adeshewa Odushoga is in this report, in this report, helps us understand the reason or reasons behind the sudden attention of the world's leaders towards Africa. Please watch. The African continent has now transformed into a global diplomatic theater. World superpowers like the United States, Russia and China are vying for attention and influence in the continent, accompanied by a flurry of visits by world leaders to Africa. Russia's President Vladimir Putin hosted the first ever Russia-Africa summit, seeking to restore his nation's influence in the region that faded after the collapse of the Soviet Union. China is also seen to be showing the greatest interest of all in Africa, aiming to better connect its Belt and Road Initiative increasingly with the continent's development. It has grown its trade with the continent to $170 billion, with around 40 African countries signed onto the initiative. There's nothing wrong in doing business with the U.S. There's nothing wrong in doing things with the superpowers, whether it's China, whether it's all of them. But the thing is, our managers, our leaders, are they clear on what they want for us? It's not enough to just sign some of these things off and at the end of the day, we do not get the, the optimal benefit that we ought to get from all the deals. So what I will advise is whatever we're doing, we should do it knowing deliberately, you know, being conscious and strategic in what we do and engage our economics. The United States is deepening its engagement with the African continent with visits by its top officials, part of which is the visit by the Vice President Kamala Harris's nine-day trip to Ghana, Tanzania and Zambia. Also, the U.S. First Lady Jill Biden was also in Africa in February, where she visited Namibia and Kenya, following the December U.S.-Africa Summit in Washington, where President Joe Biden says the U.S. was all in on Africa's future. And today, I'm also calling for the African Union to join the G20 as a permanent member of the G20. Africa is currently the fastest growing continent in the world. Um, Africa is the future of the world. And Africa will be um, the world will actually rely on Africa in the years to come. If we look at history, it doesn't look like all of this agreement have paid us sufficiently enough as it ought to over the years. And so my advice will be, whatever we're doing, whatever agreement we're going into, we must go into it knowing, understanding the benefit that would come out of it and be sure that our people or Africa gets the best of the deal at the end of the day. While different African countries are building diverse relationships with these countries in the face of the growing competitions among the global powers, African leaders are urged to build strong negotiations to improve trade and social intercourse within the continent. Adesha Waldishoga reporting for News Central. Well, we see the transformation from being the continent most bought and sold to being the continent that people are selling their ideas to. I mean, I would say it's a fantastic transformation. But then again, a lot of people will ask, why, I mean, suddenly is there so much attention on Africa? Now, some people will say that it's just a power play. You know, the different powerful uh, world power countries trying to establish dominance in this region. And then some people will, will actually say that they definitely do care about the growth and development of the continent. Well, we'll find out because we have uh, someone who will help us clarify things on the show this evening. Now, joining us in this conversation is a public affairs analyst, Dr. Eche Sikanku. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Eche. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Now, let's go straight into the conversation. Now, I was just mentioning, you know, the reason, the possible reasons for uh, the sudden attraction and attention on the African continent. Now, while some would say that the U.S. Vice President is on African soil to strengthen diplomatic ties, 
Other school of thoughts believe that the U.S. is trying to counter the growing influence of China. We know what, you know, the, the power tussle has been be between those two countries. So, I mean, help us clarify, what is your thought on that matter? Um, yes, your initial propositions uh, aren't far off from the truth. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the world is changing in very significant ways. Um, there are moves by other emerging powers, such as China and Russia, and of course concerns in the Middle East as well, um, about uh, co competing powers uh, within the global system. And so the fact is that uh, the U.S., uh, which is made as a really natural superpower, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and um, feel as though their competition as the defining superpower is for the opposition is impressive. And so when you come to Africa, you see that um, China has increased in foreign uh, in the continent, especially in one of the countries is visiting Zambia and also in, in Tanzania. I mean, a lot of the loans that are being built by Zambia at this point are Chinese loans with high, very high interest rates. But also, I think so that is one point in terms of the U.S. making sure that its presence in Africa is not already diminished. But then there's been also security and defense implications as far as this is concerned. I mean, some people have referred to it as the militarization of Africa. Uh, the, the, the fact is that the U.S. has been constantly concerned about terrorism and the increasing speed of conflict globally. And uh, one of the major places that um, terrorists have their heads is in Africa or so we um, in the Horn of Africa, Al Shabaab in Ethiopia, East Africa, and now in West Africa, they, they are doing concerns, Burkina Faso, right around us, and Niger, and in Chad, and all other places. So um, the U.S. is also very concerned about making sure that um, it, it, its presence here, at least militarily, um, is, is being apt in, uh, in terms of the fact that they are able to counter the growing spread of terrorism. Um, and Islam. And, and, and it's the first time, for instance, high profile officials, such as, you know, the Secretary of the Treasury, Jessica Yellen, came here two weeks ago. Um, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, was here. And not too long ago, Joe Biden, the first lady of the U.S., was also in Namibia and other countries. And now he's been followed by uh, uh, Kamala Harris. And yeah, there's some information that Biden is talking about. So, um, it, and, and of course, uh, let's not forget that the, one of the top U.S. commanders was also in West Africa, specifically Ghana. He had a couple of weeks before the vice president came. So, so yes, um, there's the whole counterbalance to China and other things, but there is also the, 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 the financial, the economic, and also the military aspect that we need to, we need to draw money to. All right, Dr. Eche, um, uh, thank you for clar clar clarifying that. Now, you did also just mention that uh, we had the, uh, uh, Jill Biden, the First Lady of America, recently visit uh, Kenya and then visit, I think, Tanzania, or another country you mentioned earlier. And now we're seeing uh, Kamala Harris visiting Ghana, Tanzania, and Zambia. Now, do you think that these three countries have something in common that is of interest to the United, to the United States, or were they just chosen at random for her to visit, like these countries that um, these special envoy or people have been visiting, are there reasons why they pick these certain countries, or it's just a you know random selection? Right. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. And one of the first things that we can bring and draw our minds to is the fact that the U.S. has been a global proponent of democracy. One of the major Function that they see themselves perform is to be the shining light, the leader, or the proponent of spreading democratic ideas across the world. It's, it's probably one of the major foreign policy ideas of, of the U.S. And so, anytime they get a chance, they want to hype up or they want to drop up a regime that they see as consistent with the tenets of democracy. So, and Ghana always comes up in that way because um, it is seen not just by the U.S., but globally as one of the uh, shining stars of democracy, I mean, and comparatively within the African context. I remember when Barack Obama came here a couple of years ago, that was one thing he did not hide. He said the main, one of the main reasons was because they wanted to make sure a good example of how democracy can thrive or can succeed in Africa. So in short countries that we have that people, the two countries are regarded as being fit in the democratic ideas, 
And the fourth country is that they do that um, culturally or historically um, would be emblematic of what Africa represents. And Ghana and was the first country to be independent out of the Ghana and the, the country's history with countries runs very, very, very deep. So culturally and symbolically to um, the, these, these are part of the reasons why they both the best part the economic and the financial part um, as well. And the fact that they want to present themselves as better partners for Ghana and Tanzania and, and um, Zambia compared to the other countries. You know, Zambia for now is really you know, the high interest rates from Chinese money and um, they, 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 they are really looking for the opportunity to restructure those loans or get a reprieve from it. And the U.S. wants to you know, offer itself as a, a, a better partner or a more wealthy partner in order to uh, entrench it within the continent. And so that might have informed um, part of the reason why these countries were chosen. All right, Dr. Ajay, also in your opinion, do you think that African countries at this point should be wary of uh, involvement from the Western body, especially the U.S. and China, because a lot of people would say that this is just another way uh, to, I don't know, ex exploit these countries. It's not just a power play now. It's like um, Africa is now the, you know, I don't know how to put it, let's say a toy in the hands of this country. So they're just tossing the ball back and forth. And wh what exactly should be Africa's stance on this issue? Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, it, it is, it is the, the probably the modern day version of um, the the scramble for Africa again, if you want, in a probably in a post-colonial way. Uh, but yes, it, it, it's important that um, um, Africa goes into these conversations very mindful about what their, their interests are. I mean, every country is defined by its national interests or its national goals or foreign policy ideas. And it's important that Africa or African countries like Ghana and some of the countries that he, he, uh, she's visiting and in West Africa, East Africa, wherever, Southern Africa, it, it is important that African countries also try to decipher what it is that they want from this kind of relationship. And we know that the defining thing that has governed or that has been a concern for such international relationships or partnerships over the previous year has been the concern about the unequal level of the, uh, in a relationship because of the impact in terms of trade and the lopsided way such um, 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 uh, partnerships or diplomatic relations are taken. And some of us have also said that they are described by a dependency syndrome, you know, on the side of Africa. And so the, 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 the point is that these are the major principles or theories or frameworks that seem to circumscribe the relationship between Africa and the U.S. And it's important that we here are very cognizant of that to make sure that we are coming to the table as, as equal partners, that the discussions point to a direction that ensures sustainable, long-term development and not short-term, cut a short um, approaches that seem to benefit the interests of one side. I think these should be the things that should be on the mind of African leaders as they go into um, these partnerships or these agreements to make sure that Africa is uh, being presented as, as, as a sort of unequal partner for investment and development, you know, and not just with a begging basket as always. The, um, you know, the reasons why these superpowers could be visiting some African countries. Now, how about reasons why they may not be visiting certain countries that we would have expected them to visit? Um, in this case, I would be a bit, um, would I say, selfish. Now, certain countries like Nigeria, that one would expect, um, as big as it is, being Africa's largest economy, um, largest population, we know the kind of exports that, uh, that Nigeria has in terms of goods and in terms um, of, of people as well. Why would you think that a country like like Nigeria and then particularly in the north, say like uh, Egypt and, and, and well, one could handpick a few. Uh, why do you think some of these countries may have been avoided by uh, certain members of these uh, superpowers? Well, um, I, I know that conversation has, has come up every now and again. And for me, um, I think that especially if you compare it the reason why um, the first black president visited Ghana first and 
um, again, did not go to Nigeria. And if you compare that to what is happening now, I, for instance, think that one of the major factors is what we had mentioned, which is the good governance proposition, right? Uh, the good governance proposition. And the U.S. Uh, see Ghana as a, a good example, okay, that, that, that they prop up. And Nigeria um, has, has just had an election, and uh, they have been concerned. I mean, some may be not confirmed, and maybe the Supreme the, the courts have to deal with that. But um, concerns have been raised, you know, in my meeting from the election. And we also do know um, some of the troubles or problems that Nigeria has had um, in terms of uh, terrorism and other internal issues that have been that have been going on. And we did make the point that Nigeria does have a very huge market, you know, and so it, it does also um, serve as a good destination for investment uh, between Ghana, I mean, between Nigeria and the rest of the world. But I, I do think that um, they, they, are, they are probably looking at other things. Um, as I mentioned, even the investment that was announced in Ghana, the $139 billion package that was announced, was more towards issues that have to do with uh, peace and security. Um, when the Secretary of State went to Niger, he also announced a $150 million uh, humanitarian aid for the Sahel region. And then also um, the $100 million package that was announced was to address conflict prevention in Benin Republic, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Guinea, Togo. So um, maybe the expectation is that uh, some of these initiatives, especially um, the visit that to do with Niger and Dabu's region would cover the Nigerian region. Um, and so maybe that might have been taken care of. But for me, I, I think that the U.S. sees Ghana as one of the countries that they can present to the rest of the world, you know, as a, an example of how democracy can work. And, and so, and because, I mean, they cannot go to every country, you know, they cannot go to every country. So I guess with West Africa, uh, they decided uh, to, to, to go that route, you know. Um, that does not to say that Nigeria does not have, a, of course, it does have the market and huge, huge potential and huge, huge uh, um, opportunities you know, for international trade. And the, the most important thing is that Africans learn to trade among, them, among themselves. You see, at the end of the day, when we have all these discussions, the fact of the matter is that we cannot continue to depend on the international community um, as Africans. We have to include inter-African trade. That is why the African Intercontinental Free Trade Agreement was signed with this headquarters. We need to trade more amongst ourselves. We need to coordinate and cooperate more amongst, uh, more amongst ourselves. And probably there wouldn't be that need uh, to only look up to external sources uh, to help us. I, I believe maybe that is where the conversation should also be heading towards, um, apart from the fact that we, we just have to uh, be seen as being in the shadows of countries like the United States. This um, has been done. What exactly should we be expecting from these countries? That's after the visit of the, the uh, US VP and, of course, the China and all that. What should we be expecting? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I could kindly get your question again. Okay, so I'm saying that, I mean, the U.S. has come to visit some countries, started a three-day visit, and then they've promised a lot of things, you know, building uh, uh, and infrastructure and also brokering relationship and all of that. And we're expecting China to do the same, and they've been doing that for a while. So I'm asking what Africa is expecting from these countries. Well, do you think that all their promises will will be made good, or do you think that these are just bluffs? Yeah, well, I mean, you see, Ghana is on its own. It's going to its own problems. You know, we all know what it is. Uh, the that restructuring, the inability to um, honor some of its debt obligations, the high rise of inflation, um, the downturn in the economy, and all of that. And so today, for instance, the, 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 the government of Ghana is trying to uh, bring new taxes to be um, uh, passed by parliament. They are hoping that that happens. 
So, I mean, they're not only going to be going to the same today and the same as economy. And so I believe that any help that they can get or we can get or the country can get, um, we will be we will very, very much work. And in fact, if you follow the conversation, you realize that the president of Ghana has appealed to countries like Germany and the US, for instance, to help prop up or support its, its economy and um, kind of uh, intervene in the current downturn. So, I, I think that um, it is about what they, they might make out of the situation now and the things that have been announced, okay, there, are, there are several of them. Like I said, I've already mentioned the PTCP and Security and Stabilization One. There's also one billion initiative that has been announced by the US Vice President Kamala Harris to improve women's economic empowerment. That will cover Africa, not just Ghana or anything like that. Okay, so. Um, these are very specific things. And also, as, um, as we are talking, there are various military operations that are going on um, between the U.S. and several countries in Africa. So these are some of the very, very, very immediate um, things that we, we can see. But, um, and we also know that any time the U.S. Vice President travels, it brings that kind of attention. Okay? And the hope is that that kind of attention would help to increase foreign direct investment, and other forms of investment in different parts of Africa will help to make this continent a, a choice of destination for people in the U.S. will increase, we need to increase coverage and, and uh, other things, you know. So, and that, that, that is always the expectation, you know, um, the world is moving in a way that it is very important that alliances are created in order to solve some of the most intractable problems that are, uh, the world is facing now, even when it comes to health. You know, for instance, we all know what the coronavirus brought and how it was very, very, very important for countries to live together. You know, I, I, I know that in Kenya, for instance, um, there are plans to, by Moderna, to set up a center in Kenya for the development of whole growth vaccines. So, but, but, and you do know that other, other uh, industries are trying to set up plant, car manufacturing plants in Africa, you know. So, the thing is that uh, there's a hope that that bilateral economic relations depends on what our leaders, the kind of discourse that our, that our leaders uh, are, are engaged. The expectation is that such alliances and collaborations would, would lead to cooperation and coordination to solve some of the most problems that we are facing in the world today, including climate change, um, corruption, and governance issues, education, health, and other social issues. So, I mean, we, we can only wait and see uh, what the outcome will be a couple of years from now. All right, wait and see what the outcome is a couple of years from now. I believe that's a fantastic, pay, uh, well, fantastic place to end the conversation. Uh, Dr. H.J. Sikanku, thank you so much for joining us and uh, for contributing to this conversation. We certainly do hope that the visits of these world leaders will not be another uh, way of sharing the African cake. At this time, there will be mutual, benef you, you know, mutual benefits between Africans and, of course, these countries. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.